so we are live now you can see. okay Namaskar everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, special online session celebrating the World Meteorological Day. IITM celebrates this day every year and uh, being in the business of weather and climate research, this day is very important for us and uh, we organize a special lecture that is very much based on the theme of the day and this year the World Meteorological Day theme is the ocean, our climate and weather. With his expertise in ocean sciences and its transformation into societal benefits, today we have the honor and privilege that uh, Dr. T. Srinivasa Kumar, Director in Quais, Hyderabad, is with us to deliver the IITM World Meteorological Day Special Lecture 2021. Before he proceeds to enlighten us on uh, societal benefits of uh, ocean information services, uh, I would uh, Invite IITM Director Professor Ravi Shankar Nanjundayati to please give his uh, welcome remarks and uh, briefly introduce Dr. Kumar to our audience. Over to Professor Nanjundayati. Uh, thank you, Mr. Abhay. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Srinivas Kumar and all the others who are virtually with us on this day, that is the World Meteorological Day. You would have liked to have a physical talk by uh, Dr. Srinivas, but uh, you know, situations are such that we will not be, at least this year, we can't have it. Uh, so it, it's a welcome again, Dr. Srinivas. And to those who are not familiar, I mean, I'm sure most of you are familiar with uh, Dr. Srinivas, but just a brief bio, which is more like a formality. I'm sure all of you are very, very much aware of uh, Srinivas and his uh, good work but just a brief bio of him before we start the talk uh, dr kumar is presently the director of the indian national center for ocean information services hyderabad it is an autonomous body under the ministry of earth sciences government of india he has more than 22 years of experience he has worked at uh, various uh, techno managerial positions and has managed large scientific projects in different capacities and roles at various prestigious organizations. Before joining INCOIS as director in August 2020, Dr. Kumar was heading IOC UNESCO Intergovernmental Coordination Group for Indian Ocean, Tsunami Warning and Mitigation Systems, ICG slash IOT WMS quite a bit of a mouthful i'm sure his work was equally demanding as the name itself suggests this was in australia prior to that he was the head of advisory services and satellite oceanography group at incois he has immensely contributed in advancing the science of tsunami warning and the successful implementation of various important projects related to tsunami early warning fishing zones multi-hazard vulnerability mapping coral reef bleaching, and many other areas of work. Earlier, he was also served in ISRO. Dr. Kumar is the recipient of several national and international awards, including the prestigious National Geosciences Award in 2010 and the Indian National Geospatial Award in 2008. With a PhD in marine science, he has more than 70 peer-reviewed publications to his credit. I now request Dr. Srinivas to give his talk. Dr. Srinivas. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ravi, uh, for the generous introduction. And it's a real privilege uh, to be here today. And then a very uh, good morning to you and all the colleagues uh, who have, who have uh, tuned in uh, to this uh, WMO Day uh, talk. Uh, so let me uh, share my presentation. Okay, uh, is my presentation visible, Abhay? Yeah, yeah, very much, sir. Please go ahead. All right, all right. So th thank you uh, very much uh, and good morning once again. Um, so I'll be talking today uh, briefly about uh, so societal benefits of ocean information services. Uh, as uh, Professor Ravi uh, introduced, 
of course, uh, several colleagues in uh, IITM, uh, I'm, uh, I'm aware of the work that INCOIS does. Uh, so I represent uh, Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services, uh, which is uh, under the Ministry of Earth Sciences IIT, as the IITM. Uh, we are sister institutions. Uh, and then, uh, uh, so we work on ocean observations, information advisory services. So I'll actually try to take you through some of the activities that we do at INCOIS. Uh, and then I'm very happy that uh, this year's World uh, Meteorological Organization Day, there's a WMD of 2021. The theme is uh, the oceans, our climate and weather. Uh, so th this is uh, very uh, timely uh, in the sense that uh, the, the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development uh, started, uh, uh, was launched in January this year, and it will run from 2021 to 2030, where there are going to be a lot of uh, activities that are going to focus on oceans, our understanding of the oceans, uh, the, the, the benefits that we can derive from the oceans, of course, how do we, uh, you know, do that uh, in a sustainable way. Uh, so all this is actually going to be the, uh, the, the focus of the UN Ocean Decade uh, of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And then it's very timely and apt that uh, this year's theme of the WMO Day is our, uh, you know, the oceans, our climate and weather. Um, so... Uh, just uh, you know, uh, for completeness, we, let us actually uh, see why oceans are important. Um, most of us uh, know this, but then the air that we breathe, uh, you know, every second, uh, you know, breath that we ta take, the oxygen comes from the oceans actually. Um, and then of course the ocean stores 50 times more CO2 than our atmosphere. Uh, so it's a sink to the carbon uh, dioxide that is actually produced uh, by by human uh, anthropogenic activities. Um, and then it regulates the climate. Uh, 70, covering 70% of the ocean surface, uh, the oceans we know transport heat from the equator to the poles, and then they regulate our climate and weather patterns. Uh, and of course, they're important for recreation, they're important for transportation, um, and uh, economy. Uh, I mean, we talk so much about uh, blue economy these days. Uh, so most of the ocean economy, uh, it is actually the oceans produce in goods and services uh, and they employ many people. Uh, food, of course, the oceans give us about 90% of the global fisheries, they come from the oceans. And then the 25% of global biological productivity comes from the oceans. So not only fish, actually, there are several products that, uh, you know, that come from the oceans that actually uh, get into our uh, food chain. And then, of course, medicines, a lot of medicinal products, they come uh, from the uh, oceans. The, uh, and then, uh, of course, 50% of the human population and 70% of Omega cities, they are near the coast, 100 kilometers from the shoreline. Uh, and a lot of energy supplies, about 25 to 30% of the global energy supplies are estimated to come from the oceans. They could be from tidal energy, thermal energy, gas hydrates, and so on and so forth. And very importantly, the oceans, uh, as all of us uh, appreciate uh, um, that, uh, you know, they are the driving force for monsoons. And then they are the source of oceanogenic disasters such as uh, uh, cyclones, uh, tsunamis, sea level rise, that is actually an impact that due to the impact of climate change, et cetera. And in spite of being so important, the oceans are the Earth's least expo explored frontier. Um, as you would have all heard, we know more than this uh, about the surface of the Mars than we know about the bottom of the oceans. So, so this, is a, this is something which the UN Decade of Ocean Science uh, you know, uh, intends to change. And then, of course, all our institutions in COIS, NIOT, NCCR, CMLRE, IATM, IMD, all the institutes that are under our Ministry of Earth Sciences, they are actually uh, trying to, you know, change this, uh, you know, and bring a step change in our understanding of the oceans and then how it impacts our climate and weather. So some phenomena of interest in the oceans. Uh, we actually, there are molecular processes that are sub-meter level to actually processes like uh, ENSO, uh, which, are, which actually span thousands of kilometers on the spatial scales. Then you talk about time scales, you, you, you actually start from you know, time scales ranging from a few seconds to years, to decades, to centuries. So 
these processes like you know, the range from surface waves to phytoplankton blooms to internal tides, fronds, eddies, coastally trapped waves and so on and so forth. So what all we are trying to study of, about the oceans, they fall within these different spatial and temporal scales. Now, coming to the Indian Ocean, uh, Indian Ocean is again very important. Like there are more than 50 nations about, around the Indian Ocean, most of which are developing ones. There is about 1.5 billion population and then with heterogeneous cultural heritage in all these countries. Uh, I quote here from the Indus 2 uh, report, which is actually something which is a publication by uh, Iogus, Clivar, Goose, Cyber, uh, Indian Ocean Panel, and all these scientific bodies. Um, our own colleagues like uh, Matthew, uh, Roxy, and Ravichandra, and there are all others of this uh, uh, report, which was published last year. Uh, this report talks about the societal needs uh, of a sustained observing system in the Indian Ocean. What is the what are the societal needs in the Indian Ocean? So there is rapid growth in blue economies and opportunities to exploit ocean resources and services. But again, this has to be done very sustainably. And then uh, Indian Ocean uh, is uh, on all the countries around the Indian Ocean are agriculture farming depend uh, there is this is the uh, there are ag agrarian, agrarian economies where uh, a lot is uh, dependent on the monsoons uh, and then of course the marine fisheries uh, which is dependent on ocean conditions the pr productivity primary productivity secondary productivity etc and then the extreme weather and climate change so the coastal populations are vulnerable to uh, the extreme weather and climate change uh, so these are the societal needs uh, um, of the of the Indian Ocean region of all our countries uh, in the, around the Indian Ocean region. But then, what are the operational drivers? Uh, agencies like uh, INCOIS, which is an operational agency, like what IMD is to the atmosphere, INCOIS is to the oceans. So there are several operational drivers for uh, for the Indian Ocean, which is actually we need to be able to do operational subseasonal to seasonal forecasting, and uh, in our uh, attempt to to the forecasting, we need to actually be able to understand process and then model them and then drive ocean models and atmospheric models. So we need we need surface accurate surface fluxes. And of course, we also need the ocean data assimilation systems to actually get a lot of observational data into the models and then to be able to do forecasting. So what I'm trying to make a point here is we need to better observe the oceans. We need to understand the processes and model the Indian Ocean. Not only Indian Ocean, of course, all the global oceans, but then we are talking about the Indian Ocean. Now, what are the scientific drivers? Uh, again, I quote from this report, there are several scientific drivers, like uh, I, I've showed in my previous slide, the, 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 the phenomena or processes at different temporal and uh, 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 you know spatial scales. Now, these are some things that are very important. All of us as uh, meteorologists and ocean, oceanographers would like to understand. I mean, they range from, uh, you know, oxygen minimum zones, the OMZs in the Indian Ocean, the upwelling and subduction zones, major heat flux components, and then, of course, the tropical modes of MJO and monsoon intraseasonal oscillations, the Indian Ocean dipole, and then other subtropical modes of Ningaloo Nino and uh, subtropical IOD, climate uh, change, of course, uh, how the um, you know rising temperatures, atmospheric temperatures, and the ocean temperatures are you know impacting the oceans, the sea level rise, etc., and of course cyclogenesis and 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 tsunamis, etc. So these are some of the science drivers uh, for which we need to observe and understand our uh, ocean. Now, where do we come into picture? Uh, in COIS, uh, I mean, actually. So INCOIS is uh, the specialized agency which deal with ocean observation, information, and advisory services. So we occupy that niche space where there is science being done in, 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 in several institutes in the country in, and uh, internationally. And then there is this user community, the coastal community, which actually needs uh, information uh, on how the oceans would behave and then how it would impact their lives and livelihoods. So we actually come in between uh, where we bring in, translate that science into services that are useful to the communities. And uh, the, the, our user communities are listed there on the right panel. Those are not exclusive. 
Uh, there are several others, uh, starting right from fishing communities to coastal states, the MET community, it could be IMD, it could be IATM, NCMRWF, etc. The Navy, NHOs, uh, the strategic users like Coast Guards, the ports and harbors, offshore uh, shipping industry, the fishing industry, research institutions and academia who actually do uh, pursue research uh, in oceanography. So, and what are the services that we provide? currently to these uh, users. So we, our services are categorized into ecosystem related services like fisheries, the coral reefs, the harmful algal blooms. And then we have ocean state forecasting services, um, which actually enhance the safety at sea. And then we also have disaster related services such as the tsunami and storm surge early warning systems, the high wave alerts, marine search and rescue, etc. And then we also have coastal geospatial services. How are our coasts going to be impacted by, uh, by sea level rise, say, for example, or by, uh, by a tsunami or by a storm surge or by a high wave? So those kind of services related to vulnerability assessments and the GIS, 3D GIS mapping of the coastal areas, uh, that could enable us to develop impact-based uh, focus uh, from, from our models. Uh, so that's something which INCOIS is also involved in. And then very importantly, we also provide data related services. Uh, people need data from the oceans uh, to be able to do their research. So that's something which we provide. And we contribute to weather and climate, like for example, on the analysis uh, of uh, ocean conditions uh, from our, using our ocean models, et cetera, and then capacity building. Now to be able to deliver these services, um, uh, all of us appreciate that we need huge observing systems uh, and these observe, observing systems could be remote sensing satellite based systems or the in situ systems so those are the bottom two boxes that you're seeing there once you have these observations you need to be able to if there is a satellite observations then you need to be able to uh, uh, to 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 develop algorithms uh, to be able to derive geophysical parameters from satellite data and then if you're talking about in situ observations, then you need to be able to really uh, uh, get this data into your ocean models for forcing your ocean models or for assimilating this data into ocean models, uh, do that modeling and then deliver a service actually. So this is the end to end thing. So ocean observations, ocean modeling, satellite oceanography, develop a service and then disseminate it to the community. So this is what we do. And what I'm going to talk about today in this talk is basically uh, focus a bit more on the observations because I'm sure a lot of you um, must be interested in what are the kinds of observations that India does uh, uh, among our various institutions, the ocean observations especially, and then how they could help you in the kind of the work that we that you do actually. So I will talk about uh, those a bit, and then I'll also talk finally about the services that you're seeing on the top, and then what are the economic benefits of those services. Uh, coming to the, uh, the, the, uh, the services, uh, the, the observations, like for example, there is a global ocean observing system, which is actually run by the Intergovernmental Oceanography Commission of the UNESCO, uh, together with the WMO and UNEP. Uh, this global ocean observing system is based on a global design. Uh, now, how, what do you want to do with uh, these observations? So you want to address climate, ocean, open ocean and climate. You want to also address the coastal oceans. Uh, so, so, so there is a global design and there is regional implementation. Like for example, in the Indian Ocean, there is the Indian Ocean Global Ocean Observing System, the IOGUS. It's a, it's a, it's a regional alliance. And then where do the contributions to, uh, to these uh, observing global ocean observing system come from? They come from national contributions like countries such as India within our, with our ministry, under our ministry, we do a lot of observations which are broadly contributing to a regional implementation plan and then also contribute to the global design. Because ocean observation is not something that a single country can do and then the design cannot be based on just uh, you know, uh, uh, just uh, you know, considerations of our own um, requirements. It has to fit into your overall uh, global design. Uh, so, so the themes it could be climate theme, it could be operational ocean services theme, or it could be ocean health. And then there are under goose essential ocean variables that have been defined, covering the physics, the biogeochemistry, the biology, and ecosystems. And then what you see down below around this globe are, are, are all those essential 
ocean variables that need to be measured by systems that contribute to the goose so that there is a standard uh, on what you observe, how you observe, and then how this information can get into, uh, they can contribute to understanding the overall, you know, oceans, weather, or climate. So this is a broad, uh, the global uh, ocean observing system. And coming into the Indian Ocean again, um, like I mentioned before, there is an Indus, Indian Ocean Observing System. Uh, what you're seeing here on the left uh, panel is actually designed for Indus. Now, Indus 1 started in 2006, and then uh, the Indus 2 now is actually uh, something which is an aspiration from 2020 to 2030. In fact, when Indus started, and even to now, even now to a certain extent, Indian Ocean has been the least observed of all the other oceans. And then Indus really helped uh, set up uh, a lot of observing systems, starting from mood buoys. A lot of our, our Indian uh, observing systems also contribute to the Indus, like the Argo floats, the, our mood buoys of the National Institute of Ocean Technology, XBTs, tide gauges. So the, all the dots that you see here, either they are already existing there, the Rama buoys, etc. A lot of countries uh, come together to put these observing networks, and then uh, and then actually this data is available to uh, drive our uh, ocean models or atmospheric models, et cetera. Uh, so all those are defined. So there is a design for Indus in the Indian Ocean region. Um, I'll not get into the details there, but then now I'll quickly get into, now where does India fit in? Where do we contribute to ocean observing systems for our own region, as well as for the entire, uh, you know, the Indian Ocean region? So the Indian Institute Observing Network, uh, we have, ocean observing uh, platforms which are uh, uh, which which actually are set up to deliver our services now these services could be like tsunami buoys they are actually there to deliver uh, to be to enable us deliver tsunami early warnings similarly tide gauges you have gnss and strong motion accelerometer networks we have wave, wave rider buoys ship, ship days ship based automatic weather stations etc cetera, etc cetera. And then you also have other uh, platforms which are there for R&D, for example, uh, like UCTDs, estimate sensors, LADCPs, uh, DCFS, uh, the, the optic profilers which can measure optical properties, etc., which are actually there for measuring certain um, um, processes. And then we also have process-specific observations where we try to have observing campaigns for uh, for learning about the ocean physical process, marine boundary layer process, and biogeochemical process. So in a nutshell, in a, in a snapshot, if you see, if you want to see what are our observing networks uh, of India, and then where they are currently, the, the bottom map on, that you see on the right side panel with all those dots, they are uh, the observing networks that are actually ocean observing networks of India. Uh, it could be by inquiries, NIOT, mostly by Inquis and NIOT. Now, of course, also there is a remote sensing satellite constellation. I'll not get into the details. ISRO launches these, uh, uh, you know, the, our ocean remote sensing satellites starting right from MOS uh, earlier um, and then to OceanSat 1 to OceanSat 2. And then now there are plans for very quickly launching OceanSat 3. And we have at Inquis capability for, for, uh, for receiving data from ocean satellites, not only Indian, but also international satellites, and then analyze that data and then use that data for our operational applications as well as for disseminating to several users. Now, I'll actually uh, talk a bit about the Argo, uh, about each of these observing networks. Now, Argo floats, uh, it's, a, it's a global uh, array of 3,000 floats in the global oceans. And in the Indian Ocean region, uh, there are supposed to be about 450 floats at every three by three degree uh, grid. And then uh, right now, uh, India, INCOIS contributes about 50 floats a year for this uh, Indian Ocean uh, Argo in the Indian Ocean region. And uh, now we are actually getting into uh, deployment of uh, uh, most of the Argo floats. Of course, so, long, so far they have been measuring temperature and salinity profiles from up to 2000 meter depth in the oceans. And now we are actually getting into measurement of uh, bio uh, biological uh, uh, parameters using these argo floats through floats called bioargo um, and then they can actually measure like chlorophyll a dissolved oxygen backscatter nitrate etc 
And the application of these Argo floats is to improve ocean and climate forecasting, of course, understand ocean atmosphere interactions, because they actually give all these parameters in the upper 2000 meter um, ocean depth. Uh, and then we also use this for, you know, predicting the seasonal to decade the climate variability. Argo is basically for climate applications. Uh, and then you do, you can actually use them for global ocean analysis. And then of course, they are operationally going into, you know, being assimilated into OGCMs globally. Um, so, so the GT, data is available over GTS and then organizations like INCOIS, NCMWFI, IITM, um, they actually assimilate this information into their uh, uh, OGCMs actually. And of course, uh, uh, they're used for atmospheric modeling, uh, finally. And uh, future plan, of course, we will continue to deploy 50 Argo floats a year. And coming to new kind of observing systems that we are, uh, we, that we, uh, that India has currently very new, recently got into is the gliders, uh, which can actually make uh, vertical profiles uh, of temperature, salinity, chlorophyll, whatever Argo floats uh, does, they can uh, be also measured by gliders. The only difference being that the gliders can actually have a mission. You can send these gliders uh, over long transects and then have them do the uh, profiles the way that you design them and then retrieve them back. So we have, uh, we have now, Incois has deployed very recently two gliders along the, in the Bay of Bengal transect. We will in future also be doing the Arabian Sea transects uh, under the deep, deep ocean mission. So two of these gliders are currently uh, have been deployed a couple of weeks back uh, in the Bay of Bengal. Now, coming to wave rider buoys, we have a large network of wave rider buoys, about 16 wave rider buoys all along the Indian coastline. INCOIS maintains these wave rider buoys and then they help us provide uh, our ocean wave forecasting uh, um, uh, service. Uh, so they help us in understanding wave conditions over different time scales, starting from diurnal to intra-seasonal to interannual. Uh, and then the data is, of course, uh, used by us to validate our ocean models, uh, wave models, and then be able to provide uh, services. Like, for example, what you're, what you're seeing in the uh, bot uh, bottom right corner is actually a real-time um, the uh, comparison of uh, our wave forecast with the uh, wave rider buoy, observed wave rider buoy, uh, waves from the wave rider buoy. So this information is available on the INCOIS website. So they are used for operational forecasting. Now INCOIS al also has a large network of about uh, 34 automatic weather systems on research, not only research vessels, but ships of the Shipping Corporation of India. These measure uh, relative uh, uh, humidity, SWR, LWR, SST, uh, a temperature, wind vectors, etc., and then all this data is available through the GTS, available for um, uh, for modeling uh, uh, applications, and of course for validation of uh, the um, uh, the model outputs. So, 34 of such systems are available. All, always, these are on ships, and then transmitting data in real time. Uh, these ships are mostly operating in the Indian Ocean. Tsunami tsunami buoy network, of course, tsunami buoys measure the pressure. Uh, I mean, water level that is derived from the pressure, bottom pressure, because the bottom pressure sensor sits at the ocean bottom. These, uh, we have seven, uh, uh, network of seven buoys maintained by INCOIS and IMD, uh, sorry, uh, the NIOT. Uh, they measure uh, the water level and then help us uh, provide operational tsunami early warning. But in addition to that, these uh, sea level information is also used for scientific studies. Recently, our colleagues in INCOIS published a, uh, an article uh, a, a publication in Nature Communications, which talked about the basin-wide sea level coherency in the tropical Indian Ocean, uh, driven by the MJO. Uh, so, so these uh, data sets are very useful for, uh, in addition to tsunami warning, for um, for um, uh, research applications. Tide gauges in COIS maintains uh, uh, a network of 36 tide gauges, again primarily for tsunami warning because Survey of India also maintains a tide gauge network for long-term sea level monitoring. But then nevertheless, this network is also used for other research applications, like the bottom con uh, panel that you're seeing here is actually a tide gauge being used for tsunami warning. So this is uh, for the event in 2012, a Campbell Bay tide gauge, how it has monitored the tsunami wave. But then we also use this data for long-term sea level rise kind of applications. The top panel that you're seeing here is in different colors on the coast is actually how the sea level has varied at different parts of the Indian coastline as derived from uh, tide gauge data uh, of the last 
100 years from the survey of India tide gauges. So these are the kind of applications that are possible using tide gauges. We also have a very dense network of uh, GNSS, that is GPS sensors and strong motion accelerometers. Again, which can be, which are primarily for measuring the uh, peak ground acceleration and vertical displacement for tsunami warning. But then as you would, uh, as you appreciate the uh, GNSS information can be used for um, IPWV uh, for, uh, you know, integrated perceptible water vapor and uh, TEC kind of applications for uh, weather. Uh, so 35 uh, stations are uh, currently operational in the Andaman Nicobar Islands, uh, transmitting data to INCOIS in real time. And of course, mood buoys, many of you are aware of this. These are run by the National Institute of Ocean Technology. And then these, the data from these buoys, again, is used in uh, assimilation into operational uh, modeling uh, systems. And of course, we use this information in quite uh, uh, extensively for monitoring and validating our model uh, uh, forecasts uh, that we make. Uh, so this is by NIOT. And again, HF radars. There is a, there are five pairs of radars, again, run by NIOT, which monitor the ocean surface currents 200 kilometers from the coast. And this data is, again, extensively used for validation of the coastal forecasts that are uh, being put out by INCOIS. And then, uh, of course, the data is also used extensively for, uh, for, uh, for research. There was a recent publication from INCOIS and uh, um, uh, INCOIS colleagues, which actually try to look at the uh, variability of uh, coastal currents along the shelf and then try to see and and they identified that actually the annual variability that is uh, seen in the uh, slope uh, of the slope is not actually uh, seen in the uh, shelf region so these are the, some of the uh, research kind of uh, applications of this uh, hf radar networks Drifting buoys, again, uh, this is a global network. Uh, what you're seeing on the map there is all the drifting buoys that are currently in the, in, in the global oceans. Uh, there are several drifting buoys in the Indian Ocean. And then INCOIS uh, manages, uh, uh, puts ab ab about 50 drifting buoys uh, in, the, in the Indian Ocean um, so, uh, every year. So that's the, uh, that, that's the uh, network of drifting buoys. And then of course they measure the water temperature and atmospheric pressure. And this information again is available uh, or the GTS available for assimilation into uh, models. Um, uh, so, so drifting buoys is again a very, and of course also used for several scientific uh, applications uh, like for example, studying the annual harmonics of zonal currents, et cetera. XBT and XCTD transects, again, this data is not available in real time. They actually are run along the shipping routes. We measure the temperature and salinity profiles up to 760 meter depth. Uh, and then these are used for long-term monitoring of upper ocean thermal fields. Uh, and this is very important in regions, these profiles in regions where we can't put Argo floats because Argo floats are primarily put in the deep oceans. But then within our EZs or coastal regions where you really can't, Argo floats uh, uh, are not an option for measuring the profiles. So these are the uh, uh, systems that can actually provide these uh, uh, temperature and salinity profiles uh, in the coastal oceans. And now we are working on making these uh, systems uh, real time so that again, this data can be useful for uh, you know, our modeling and forecasting purposes. And we also through National Institute of Oceanography manage uh, several coastal ADCPs acoustic Doppler current profilers in the coastal regions and then also equatorial current meter networks. These are again, uh, not real time, but uh, they actually help us in assessing the long-term variability of ocean currents in the coastal shelf slope and equatorial Indian Ocean. Uh, and of course, seasonal, intra-seasonal, intra-annual variability of ocean currents along the, out, uh, along the uh, Indian uh, coastal region. And of course, we also use this data extensively for validation of our ocean currents that we actually um, forecast, um, try to model using our uh, ocean general circulation models. Uh, so there is a future plan to expand this again through NIO for the Gulf of Manar um, uh, and the Lakshadweep Sea. Flux mooring, again, uh, colleagues in IITM would be uh, very interested in this. Uh, this is actually a mooring uh, that we deployed and then ran for more than a year from 23rd May 2019 to 7th October 2020 uh, to understand the mixed layer dynamics, uh, fine tune the bulk flux algorithms and, uh, uh, you know, understand the, uh, you know, oceanography upper uh, ocean processes um, in, the, in the Bay of Bengal. 
uh, and then the data is currently being processed. And uh, this is actually a sen where we, we had DCFS measurements uh, um, on the on the buoy uh, and estimate measurements, of course, and several oceanographic sensors uh, under the under the sea. So this is we are we are having plans to move this uh, to the Arabian Sea uh, in the future. We are also working on biogeochemical sensors uh, because a lot of observations so far has been on observing the physical oceanographic parameters mostly, but then there's a lot of focus now on getting into biogeochemistry. We talk about ocean acidification, etc. So this is something we are getting into, ocean, the, uh, the monitoring of the biogeochemical sensors. Now, this is a biogeochemical sensor that we actually uh, mounted on the NIOT mood buoy. Uh, so more such observations will be made for observations of uh, uh, PCO2 and pH, etc. Uh, into the future. Then we are also working on coastal water quality buoy network along with the National Center for Coastal Research uh, in Chennai, where uh, we would like to make observations of the coastal water quality. So there will be several coastal water quality parameters, both physics, chemistry, and biogeochemistry uh, that uh, would be um, monitored on these buoys. So initially we are actually deploying about two buoys, and then we would uh, int we intend to expand this to six buoys uh, in the future. So the first phase of deployment would be in Kochi and Vishakapatnam, and this is in addition to several buoys that are being uh, deployed in the near coast by the NCCR to monitor the uh, coastal water quality. And we also are working on, of course, process-specific observations, several of them. This is one example which I picked where IATM colleagues are very closely involved. Uh, where we would like to make intense observations, like uh, similar to what was done in the um, OMM uh, in the Bay of Bengal, we would like to kind of replicate it into the Arabian Sea, trying to um, observe the processes, uh, the the boundary layer processes in the ocean and atmosphere in the Arabian Sea, because that's a big uh, uh, gap area now. And then uh, we would like to use that information for uh, you know improving the parameterization schemes in our ocean models, understand the mixed layer process, boundary layer process, et cetera. And of course, eventually um, you know, with, the, with the view that we'll be able to uh, improve our uh, you know, predictions, uh, of course, not, uh, IATM, enable IATM and uh, IMD to enhance the predictions of monsoon. And where does all this data go now? Ocean data services is one primary area that Incois works on. So from the observations, now I'm trying to get into the services in the next 10 minutes or so, I'll try to uh, uh, try to show you some of the services that go out from Incois. Uh, so uh, the data gets into, Incois is the National Oceanographic Data Center. So if you see on the top left panel, the Argo floats, drifters, HF radars, whatever data, whatever observational platforms that I spoke about before, they are, uh, they are synthesized and then made available in the National Oceanographic Data Center at INCOIS. And then they are quality controlled. If, they are, if the data is uh, real-time data that is to be used in the, uh, simulated into the ocean uh, models that is available through the GTS, and then uh, data is available, there is a National Oceanographic Data Policy uh, that we use to uh, provide this data to the users, to the research institutions, to academic users, to, to any user that needs this data. And that is actually provided through um, you know, web, through live access servers, uh, through Aradap, offline means such as CDs, because we generate atlases. In some cases, like for example, there are Argo data used to generate atlas. Um, of the salinity or the temperature, and then those atlases are available to different users. So this uh, is how the data is available, both from the in-situ data, as well as the remote sensing data. The bottom panel that you see here is the remote sensing data products that Incois generates on a day-to-day -day basis and then used for our applications such as PFZ, etc. And on the right panel is actually, uh, it's not very clear, but what you see on the x-axis is the data sets. Like I said, in 2006, uh, Indian Ocean was so data spa sparse. And then you see over the years, it's not that we have everything now, we need to put in a lot of efforts in data, ob in observations still. We are still under observing the Indian Ocean, but still the, you know, what you're seeing in this plot is how the observation, the return of uh, data sets from different observing systems grew over the years. So the last uh, um, you know, bar that you see would be for the year 2020, perhaps. So that is actually the data returned from various observing systems. 
Now, this is a, this is a new um, um, application, which actually was launched uh, very recently by Incoys, which is called the Digital Ocean, which enables the user to request for data and then do their own analysis. They can, they can create workspaces. Like for example, you can, if you're interested in Cyclone, you can create a workspace for Cyclones and then all the data that is relevant to that particular Cyclone, be it from in-situ observations or model data sets would be, can be made available in that work, particular workspace. And then anybody who is interested in looking at that cyclone, data from different observing platforms related to that particular event can go to that workspace and then extract the data in you know very easily. So like, for example, you want to look at uh, tropical um, cyclone heat potential, or you want to look at Argo data sets that are actually there uh, along the track of that cyclone. So all that can be done using this uh, digital ocean. This is a very new application. So all that observing systems and then data services. So they get into, at Incois, we have an ocean modeling and forecasting system. Uh, I'll not get into too much of details, but Incois runs a suite of ocean models, uh, starting right from MOM to ROMs to HICOM, et cetera, for different applications, WaveWatch, SWAM, AdSerc, uh, Tsunami, Etc. And then all these actually get into uh, our uh, forecasting services. And then these could be uh, very, uh, very immediate forecasts, like for example, forecast for the next day to the next three days, to regional analysis, for example, what we do for the, uh, what we provide to, um, you know, to IATM, etc. for the regional an analysis and forecast, they could be very coastal forecast. And there could be of the time scales of uh, several minutes, like for example, tsunami warning, we go out a warning from our model uh, modeling and uh, uh, forecasting system in few minutes. So these are the time, uh, spatial and temporal scales over which the products are available, different products from our modeling systems. And then of course, we are moving towards a unified ocean modeling and forecasting framework. Uh, we also had several discussions with all um, IATM and IMD and several other institutions which do ocean modeling within the country, IASC, et cetera, to come up with a, this uh, kind of a framework uh, into the next, going into the next five years where we'll be using MOM6 as a, a primary um, uh, application uh, for global to regional to local kind of modeling. And this is also something which I thought you might find interesting where we are working on ocean climate change advisory services. Again, we'll be working very closely with IATM here. Uh, and of course the NCCR and other agencies where we try to uh, come up with uh, uh, advisories like uh, projections of sea level change and how that change might impact the, our coastal regions. Uh, so, uh, and of course, what would be the impact of climate change on the uh, cyclone intensity and frequency? This is something IATM, uh, a lot of IATM colleagues are working on and then we would like to, we would be working closely with IATM on these aspects and projection of storm surges and wind waves and then biogeochemistry of the ecosystems. So this is something which we intend uh, to do as part of the deep ocean mission. And coming to a couple of other applications, uh, I will try to close in the next uh, five minutes so that uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, the potential fishing zone advisory service is one of the uh, prime service of NCOIS. We have lots of users. The information goes to about 700,000 uh, fishermen on a daily basis on where they could go and do conduct, they, they can conduct fishing operations so that their catches will be better. Uh, so this is done based on satellite data sets. Uh, ISRO has been heavily involved in the initial development of this uh, technology. And then we use uh, sea surface temperature, chlorophyll, et cetera, to develop, uh, to uh, provide these information on a daily basis to fishermen. And of course, there is a user demand for uh, species specific forecast for tuna. And this is something also which we give on a daily basis. We have parameters such as K490, which is the water, water clarity. We actually in include information on the uh, currents, uh, the, the, the MLD, etc., which is very important for tuna fishing. So this, this is also another service that goes out from INCOIS. INCOIS also puts out coral bleaching alerts. Uh, this is again uh, based on the sea surface temperature data sets from satellite where we actually uh, provide uh, information on the probability of bleaching occurring based on the uh, enhanced sea surface temperatures. If there is any enhanced sea surface temperature or the, uh, uh, the nominal average, 
and then to how long is that particular enhanced temperature sustaining how many weeks so based on this we actually developed a developed a method and then now this is an operational service where we can actually provide bleach coral bleaching alerts uh, so we put it under no stress watch and warning if we, if there is a warning that means that the probability of corals bleaching during that particular year is very high so this has been uh, this we have been doing for several years now and it's a, it's a, it's been proven very effective we also have uh, algal bloom information service these are all the ecosystem services uh, i am talking about and this actually uh, is operational now we do uh, algal bloom monitoring based on satellite data sets and in situ data sets we put out an index um, based on uh, normal that means there is no uh, harmful alg algal bloom uh, or watch or warning again so and this is based on several uh, products that we generate from satellite data and then we generate an index to be able to provide this based on all those parameters that that could be chlorophyll a um, like microplankton uh, nanoplankton uh, so bloom index uh, phytoplankton species sst so these are all the parameters that we actually analyze to give that service now coming to safety uh, ocean state forecast we have this is one of our, again a prime service that we tell fishermen for example say where to go but then whether it is safe to go now this information we give from ocean state forecast this is again based on several models that we run at in wave uh, currents uh, so on and so forth and there are specialized products for different industries for fishermen then for small vessel advisory services which is an impact based services which tells the uh, the the safety um, um, margin at which uh, different sizes of vessels can operate so and then we can provide uh, forecast along ship routes etc cetera, etc cetera. and the swell forecast for example with this, the swells originating from the southern ocean um, this is something which used to create a lot of flooding even now creates a lot of flooding in the uh, southwest coast of the country so no, these are some things which we are able to monitor now we also have buoys installed in seychelles um, maldives etc to be able to track these uh, swell uh, waves uh, while they're traveling towards our coastline so the, several products on ocean state forecasting we provide we also provide information to the work with uh, coast guards on marine search and rescue based on the current information that we, gen that we developed from our o ogcms we also provide oil spill trajectory uh, information uh, work closely with coast guards and navies to provide this information on uh, uh, so that they can actually take up mitigation measures if uh, there is a spill they would know where the spill would go tsunami warning most of you know about it i'll not get into the details it is actually uh, one of the uh, very uh, good tsunami warning centers that we have providing information not only for india but for the entire indian ocean region similarly we also our tsunami warning system is a multi-hazard system we can also provide information on storm surge early warnings uh, this is something which we help imd with so we get information on the cyclone track uh, from the IMD and then we run a storm surge model at Incois in real time and provide information to IMD so that they'll be able to provide information on storm surge. So this has been validated with several models so we can provide coastal inundation uh, due to a particular cyclone, what would be the surge? So this information is uh, provided uh, um, operationally. And 3D uh, GIS and multi-hazard assessments, we have done mapping of the entire coastline of the country at a very high resolution using ALTM data uh, from NRSC. And this data is used in conjunction with several other oceanographic data, like for example, the tide gauge data to come up with an atlas called the Coastal Vulnerability Index Atlas. And then we've also done 3D mapping of the entire coastline of, of about 3,600 uh, square kilometer of area has been mapped in 3D. Uh, the, the panel, bottom right panel that you see there, uh, to be able to, uh, you know, if you know that, okay, from a tsunami, this would be the inundation. Now you could actually get to the level of, okay, how many, how much of this community could be impacted or how many of these buildings could be impacted. Now that kind of impact based services can be provided using this database. So we have done this multi-hazard vulnerability mapping at one is to 25,000 scale. Incois also does a lot of work in uh, capacity building. We have a training center called, uh, it's a category two center under the uh, UNESCO uh, that provides training to researchers, students, scientists, users, not only from India, but from the entire Indian Ocean region. And we use a variety of uh, uh, tools to reach the end users. 
like uh, we have satellite based broadcasting system like gagan and navic because fishermen once they go out of the mobile phone coverage they'll not be able to have connectivity unless they are on satellite communication which is very expensive so for the traditional fishermen we actually came up with a device uh, along with the isro and the uh, airports authority of india called gagan through which we can broadcast information to them even when they are outside the mo uh, nominal uh, mobile phone coverage now coming to the last couple of slides economic benefits now so coming to the uh, what are the benefits now i think the benefits of ocean observing systems or services is something which we cannot estimate with any reasonable accuracy because some of those things like how they impact the weather the climate and what the climate will do to the sea level and then how the sea level would impact the coastal areas the understanding of that we cannot put a value to it but then there are some tangible uh, you know benefits that that can that we can actually put out like for example by giving pfz service uh, this is a survey from ncair which says that okay there is a certain amount of uh, reduction in search time about 30 to 70% reduction in search time which means that there is a savings on fuel uh, so they spend less time at the sea and then uh, so their safety is enhanced because of osf or if we give a, a rough weather and then if they don't go to the sea and uh, there is a life saving and then if, the, if we see that there is a there is a rough seas and then the navy could not go ahead should not go ahead with the mission that could actually result in savings like tsunami for example if we give a no uh, evacuation warning that would save uh, several uh, hundreds of uh, crores of rupees which you would uh, which we would have to otherwise spend if actually people had to evacuate due to a false warning um, like for example uh, uh, taking a small number here if for the the coastal evacuation uh, expenditure from pilin for one state it was about 3500 crores uh, for for the odisha government and if you are able to avoid such an evacuation now doing that evacuation when there is when there is an event it saves all those lives so it, it doesn't really matter how much you spend but then uh, if there is no warning and then if you give if people have evacuate unnecessarily if you are able to stop that then you save that money so these are the kind of benefits and of course there is also huge environmental benefit to the service like you put less diesel into the uh, you spend less diesel you're putting in less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere uh, so there are there are several estimates that are done by several independent agencies like naip cmfri etc which says that uh, how much less greenhouse gases you are emitting by just one pfz service like p fishermen going to these locations doing fishing and then uh, putting less uh, uh, carbon uh, dioxide into the atmosphere so in conclusion uh, let me say that uh, i you all uh, would certainly agree with me that oceans are key to understanding our climate and weather they play a huge ocean observations information and advisory services they play a huge role in securing the lives and livelihoods of our communities and then we can contribute hugely to the blue economy of india which india is coming up with to meet our targets towards the sustainable development goal 14 uh, which is uh, life under water and then of course the new uh, initiative the ocean decade of ocean, the, the uh, decade of ocean science for sustainable development which is called the ocean decade there are several challenges that we want to address uh, as a oceanographic community as part of the ocean decade uh, uh, that could be pollutants ecosystems etc which are listed there as ocean decade challenges which we would like to address and then what we would like our oceans to be uh, in the future uh, which is actually the outcomes we should we need to have a clean ocean healthy and resilient ocean productive ocean predicted ocean safe ocean accessible ocean inspiring and engaging ocean so with that i conclude uh, with uh, acknowledging ac acknowledging my colleagues here who have uh, actually uh, who whom i work with and uh, who have helped me put together this brief presentation if you have any questions i am ready to take if we don't have time there is my email address on that slide please feel free to contact us thank you very much thank you dr kumar for uh, such a wonderful lecture uh, from youtube channel i see there are no question as yet because uh, you made this uh, uh information very simple to understand 
and uh, maybe even those who have a little understanding of science could understand this. Uh, uh, I would like uh, Professor Ravi, uh, sir, if he has any queries. Uh, thank you, Abhay. Thank you, Dr. Srinivas, for an excellent presentation. It was a pleasure listening to you about all the work that's being done on oceans, especially by INCOIS. It was a fantastic presentation. I have a couple of questions more out of curiosity. One of them is about the deep ocean mission, which you mentioned. Can you briefly tell us about what is the aim of it and how INCOIS and other sister organizations are going to be kind of involved and what are the kind of results we could expect? from this deep ocean mission. Yeah, thank you, Professor Ravi. Uh, thanks for that question. See, uh, under the deep ocean mission, there are several components, of course, which actually talk about uh, technology, which is done by NIOT, and then there is, uh, you know, ocean biology. Uh, there, there, are, there are several components, uh, the biodiversity, etc., which are dealt with by several agencies, not only within, uh, under MOES, but also different other ministries and departments. Now, what I would actually uh, like to uh, uh, talk a bit more about is uh, what INCOIS is, uh, um, where INCOIS is involved in. Um, and uh, so this is basically uh, how uh, we, we, we could make observations uh, to, 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 to provide climate change advisories um, uh, for the Indian Ocean region, mostly for the Indian region. Uh, so, so the, we we should be able to do observations that can be that can help us, uh, you know, observe the changes in the oceans over a long period of time, and then also use these observations and all the other observations that we have to be able to provide these, uh, uh, you know, climate change advisories. Now, as part of this, what we are planning to do is actually to deploy. Uh, uh, the gliders, which I said before, the deep ocean gliders, uh, and then, of course, uh, to be able to make transects and then make observations which which were not possible before um, uh, in, into the deep oceans, and then measure measure these pa all these parameters that can help us understand the oceans and the process much better, and then also deploy deep Argo floats. Now, the Argo floats that we deploy currently go, on, go up to two, two kilometer depth. But then the new uh, kind of Argo floats that we plan to deploy as part of this mission can go until 5,000 meter water depth, which is very important to actually make measurements in those deep oceans when you talk about, uh, you know, variability, uh, you know, uh, climate variability, and then how it has been impacting the deep oceans. So this is something which we intend to do as an observational part. And then as far as the modeling is concerned, uh, the, we should be able to develop a suitable, uh, suitable modeling framework uh, to make a projection of sea level changes. Uh, like, for example, what is the uh, overall sea level change? That is, that is like we have semi kind of uh, scenarios. We have IITM working on climate change. Whether we will be able to take this information at the regional level and then downscale it, uh, both statistically as well as dynamically. Uh, can, will be, can we be able to do that modeling and then come up with the impact of this, uh, you know, climate change uh, on sea level rise and then how that sea level rise might impact the coastal areas. Now, we have all these databases that I've talked about before on the coastal regions. Now, how can some of these, this information uh, be used to really come up with that kind of advisories? So, this is basically what we intend to do, some, of, uh, some part of it, of course. And the other thing also uh, deals with, you know, uh, what is the, how is the cyclone intensity uh, going to, uh, or the frequency uh, going to change in a climate change scenario uh, over the next 50 years or 100 years? Now, this is something which we would like to, all these things, we would like to work closely with, uh, you know, colleagues in IITM. Uh, and then, uh, you know, at the end of five years, uh, hopefully we should be able to have some uh, answers to these questions. Thank you, Dr. Srinivas. I have just one more question. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, meanwhile, sir, uh, sorry for interruption. Uh, Dr. Kumarji, can we have your video on, please? Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank sorry, you. Sorry, I didn't. Is that on now? So, you can switch off the screen sharing and then I think. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, maybe that's the reason. Okay, just one second. Yeah, now, now. On. Okay, please. Okay. Yeah. Professor Ravi, please. 
uh, yeah you mentioned about blue economy can you tell us uh, what would be inquisitor's role in blue economy and uh, studying the blue economy i mean and also what are the potential areas where they would be working on yeah so again in the blue economy there are several aspects uh, like for example there are the priority areas in our blue economy framework it's a, it's a draft policy document there are seven uh, priority uh, areas like for example there is a national accounting framework for blue economy and ocean governance how do we really account it account for it when we mean blue economy uh, what are the parameters in which we account for it and then there is coastal marine spatial planning and tourism that's one important activity priority area and there is marine fisheries uh, aquaculture and fish processing and then there is uh, manufacturing emerging industries trade technology services and skill development that's an emerging priority area and then there is another priority area on logistics infrastructure and shipping for example and then there is uh, also a priority area on coastal and deep sea mining and offshore energy and there is another priority area the priority area 7 is security strategic dimension and international engagement in fact not only in coise all our institutes under the ministry and then several other ministries they they actually can play a huge role here and uh, like you talk about any of these sectors the priority areas i think uh, you know being able to observe the oceans you you need to quantify or understand and then quantify the benefit or be able to uh, you know um, uh, monitor the entire thing we need to actually be able to observe the ocean and then most of these operations that we talk under blue economy they will need uh, you know information about the oceans so you need to model the oceans you need to forecast the oceans so i would uh, say you know ocean observations modeling and advisory services they'll play a key role in each of these priority areas that are uh, being addressed as part of the deep uh, as part of the uh, blue blue economy so most of the sectors which we are talking about in blue economy can benefit from uh, will certainly benefit from ocean observations information and advisory services from inquiries and of course other institutes of the ministry that are dealing with all the other activities they they can contribute in a big way uh, to the blue economy uh, of the ministry uh, i mean of of the of the government okay. thank you roshan uh, was any other queries sir i uh, know i don't have any more questions okay there are many but i think i <laughs> <later. laughs> yeah thank you so uh, dr kumar you really made it very simple for us to uh, understand uh, uh what are the advances in ocean sciences and how ocean information services offered by enquiries are being used for uh, societal benefits and uh, you also helped us understand in a very simple way how important the oceans are for us they are not only important for weather and climate they are also important for sustainable development as we are also observing the united nations uh, decade for uh, of ocean sciences for sustainable development so uh we must commend dr kumar and the entire enquiries team for remarkable contributions and constant striving for further advancing our understanding of the oceans and translating that knowledge into services for societal benefits we wish dr kumar and enquiries would contribute significantly to achieve the decadal goals of the safe ocean predicted ocean and transparent ocean making the life of coastal people safer better and sustainable on behalf of the entire iitm family i thank dr kumar for sparing his valuable time and enlightening us on this very important topic thank you very much dr kumar for such a wonderful lecture and thank you professor ravi for being with us and i thank everyone who joined us on on, on this online session and uh, padmakar ji and computer team for facilitating this uh, session in a very smooth way thank you very much everyone and uh, wish you all a very happy world meteorological day jai hind thank you thank you very much thank you